is that the similarities between the Bielski family and the Exodus story there, and or the Bielski Ultriad and, the, and, and that story there, and the actual Exodus are unbelievable. The swamp in which the Bielski Ultriad crossed is eight and a half miles, roughly eight and a half miles across to the island that they hit on. Uh, the movie shows some of them being killed when they're fighting the Germans. But Michael Bielski told me the ironic thing was no one was hurt. Not a single person was hurt. He said, and yet the bullets were flying over their heads like crazy. The Germans literally tried to follow them into the swamp, but were unable to do it. Just as the, just as the Egyptians tried to follow Moses into the Red Sea, and they were all drowned. In Nechamatek's book, she quotes Chaya. Chaya, by the way, is the wife of a soil. A soil was later killed in the war because he continued to fight and he ended up dying in the war. And so uh, Chaya, his wife, um, lost her husband in this war. But she's quoted in uh, Nechamatek's book as saying, the reeds were so high. And that's what was so beautiful. Tubia said, excuse me, Michael Bielski told me that when they were going through the swamp, he said that's what kept the reconnaissance planes from being able to be able, from being able to find 800 Jews in the middle of a swamp. They couldn't see them. They were literally hidden by those reeds. At the Gulf of Aqaba, it's eight and a half miles across too, by the way. Um, and the fact that Tuvi is referred to by the survivors as their modern day Moses, so many things that. It was just mind-boggling. Um, and the rabbis, as I began to talk to different rabbis, uh, rabbis that I knew personally, uh, Rabbi Mikowitz for one, Rabbi Mikowitz, he, he, he said, I can agree with the fact of Jeremiah 23, uh, as far as Yam Suf being the Gulf of Aqaba, and I'm not sure. Um, but one rabbi in particular, Rabbi Mandy, uh, uh, a rabbi down in Bonita Springs, Florida, he brought out an interesting point to me when the story, when we first began to speak about the story together. He said, you know, I can really believe this to be true. And he said, you should know as well as I do what really gives a lot of strength to this story is what Moses says in Exodus 15. Now, I'm going to, to read to you Exodus 15. Shemot is the chapter, uh, or the book, excuse me, the book we're going to go to and look at this. And um, this is something I write about in the book, and I think it's important uh, that you may find very interesting as well. Because it gives strength for, for several different things that God has opened my heart to, to understand. In chapter 15, in verse 1, it says here in the English language, Then Moses and the children of Israel chose to sing this song. Now, it doesn't actually say the word chose in the Hebrew language, but that's how they translate it. Uh, I don't know why they did that either. Let, let me get it for you in the Christian Bible. It'd be better. Um, yeah, no, it doesn't say anything about they chose to sing the song just says they sang this song. Let me just read it to you here. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. And spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. All right, now, in Hebrew it says, Az Yeshia Moshe, Uvene Yisrael et Hashira. Uh, by the way, that's uh, Shemot uh, Tetvav, uh, Yukida Tetvav, uh, and verse Aleph, first verse. Exodus, excuse me, Exodus 15. Az Yashia Moshe Uvene Yisrael et Hashira Hazot Ladonai Veyamu Lemor, and and they they said. Uh, Ashira Ladona Kiga Kiga Aga O Ashira I will sing. 
This is a future tense song, and it's something that Rashi points out in the Midrash. Um, the horse and his rider are cast into the sea. I didn't say anything to Rabbi Mendy at the time when he said this to me, but immediately, the first thing that come to my mind when I read this here, and as Rabbi Mendy pointed out, he says, you know Rashi says, I will sing unto the Lord, is a future tense song. It's a song of redemption that's yet to be sung. Now, Rabbi Mendy, if you ever happen to watch this video, let me share with you something from the Christian reading. And uh, it's the same corresponding chapter, which makes it even more ironic. If you go to Revelation chapter 15, it says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up with the wrath of God. Hmm. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, a final exodus. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses. Wow. Now, it's interesting that they sing the song of Moses, and it doesn't mention that Moses is there. But if he's killed as one of the two witnesses, he's not supposed to be there. This is in the last part of this Daniel 70th week. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Wow, what do you know? They recognize who Mashiach is and who's the one that teaches them this song? Moses does. And who does he te what does he teach them when he returns? Who Mashiach is. And of course, any Christian knows that lamb is Yeshua HaMashiach, uh, Jesus the Christ. Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Now notice, his judgments are manifest. He's about to judge that Antichrist. And as Moses points out here, Asherah Adonai Kiga'agaom Sus Berkevo Ramabayom He's cast the horse and his rider into the sea. What about the 600? What about the other 599? Why does Moses sing about only one and he speaks of it as a future tense song? Because Moses comes back along with Elijah to challenge Satan when he's incarnated in the Antichrist. And his horse and his rider, the rider that Satan chooses to use, the Antichrist, the horse, you know, that's why God brings all nations down to Jerusalem for battle. He's bringing them to judgment. So the United Nations forces will go right down with it. Mm, wow. Wow. Interesting times that we have here, but it's one of the great mysteries that God revealed to me when I was looking at the story of the Bielski family. The different things that began to come out of this, just absolutely remarkable. Um, and and, and as, as God began to reveal to me this, then I began to understand more. Just uh, let me share with you some more things here. We have a little bit of time because two parts on WBN TV. Uh, so let me just share with you a few more things here that God began to unravel in this story. There is one part of Exodus that has just been an interest to me that I'd like to share with you. Um, and this is when God is speaking to Moses. We find it in the third chapter and uh, let me just get in here and get where he is. Several things here that really come to my heart here when I begin to read this, especially one that spoke to my heart early on, is in verse 
4. God sees him turning, turning aside. That's uh, Dalet in Hebrew, by the way. Um, you could dial Gimel in verse Dalet. And I just want to find the beginning of this here. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Hashem saw that he turned aside to see, and God called out to him from amid, um, uh, amid or, or the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he replied, here am I. And the Yom Ed Moshe, Asur al Na, the Arei, which that actually says in Moses, uh, he said, I will turn aside now and see, at the Hamarei HaGadol Chazei, I will turn around and see what this great, look at this great sight. Lo Yeval Chasene, why is this bush, um, and by the way, the Chasene uh, is a, it's a thorn bush. It's not being consumed. They are Adonai Kisa Lavot Vikra Elav, and and the Lord he sees Moses turn aside, and uh, he calls out to him. Elohim, the Lord calls out to him, Mitoch uh, Chasenai from the midst of the bush or the middle of the bush. The Yomer and he says, Moshe, Moshe, Moses, Moses. The Yomer Hineni. And, and he says, Moses is speaking back, uh, Behold, I'm here. The Yomer El Tikrav Chalvum Shalnelecha, take off your shoes from off your feet. Me'aweglecha Ki Hamakum, because the ground uh, that you're on, Ashata uh, Omed, which you're standing on, Alav Adamat Kodeshu, it is holy ground. I've often wondered, is this the ground where God created Adam? Uh, interesting thought there. Uh, don't know if we have time to get into that one, but that's an interesting thought. The the uh, the Yomad, and, and let me just say, you know, can I say that? And I, I throw it out to you, and, and and people will be watching this, and they'll be saying, well, wait a minute, I thought Jerusalem was where God created Adam. He couldn't have created Adam in Jerusalem, and I'll tell you why. Because the sacrifice was offered in Jerusalem. It is believed that this is where Cain killed his brother at. If that be so, then we know they were outside of where the garden was. I do believe, though, the Garden of Eden is in another dimension. I believe that the river that flowed from Eden to the garden, which was in the east of Eden, was in another dimension, even from the dimension that Adam and Eve lived in. Because the scripture clearly says that the river flowed out, you would say, Min Eden, flowed out from Eden, and what are the garden in the east of Eden? Now, if, if the garden is in the east of Eden, how could, why then does the river have to flow out? Makes you wonder about the rock that Moses smote, which the Caldwells have a beautiful picture of that, Jim and Penny Caldwell on their website, uh, splitrockresearch.org, I believe is their website, if you want to look at that. Beautiful mammoth 60 foot tall rock and uh, in fact I'll shoot it over an email th this evening. They, they did tell me I could have permission to use it as long as I, we, we, we let people know. I always let people know where sources come from because it's important. Uh, uh, and they have a beautiful picture of that rock there. The water is that the, the eroded the base of this rock and all the stones that came come down from that. It's just huge amounts of water were eroding it. But yet it's in a desert where it's one of the least amount of rainfalls on the planet Earth. How did that happen? Now, I've never asked the Caldwell specifically, but I, do, I would like to ask, where's the hole in the rock? I believe like it was with the water that came out from the east of Eden, I believe the water come from another dimension. No wonder why their clothes and shoes didn't wear out. Imagine washing your water, washing your clothes in that water. Imagine drinking that water. No wonder why Moses' strength had not abated and he was 80 years old when the Lord took him. He's still strong. He, he came out at 40 years old, taking the children of Israel out there, and as if he is still 40 years old. God did something supernatural to these people. Unbelievable. Unbelievable what happened there. Anyway, um, where do we leave off at here? Okay. Um, okay, taking off the shoes and off the feet. And the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. 
אלוחי אברהם, אלוחי יצחק ואלוחי יעקב, ויזכר משה פניו כי יראה מהבית אל האלוהים. Now, this was very fascinating to me when I read this. When God says to Moses, he says to him right here, ויאמר אנוכי אלוחי, and he says, I am, Elohai, I am the God, Aviha, of your father. I could not help but think that Moses always battled who his father really was. You see, Moses was raised as an Egyptian. He went there as a two-year-old child. His mother, or even younger, well, no, it had to be, no, it had, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't get my thought on Jesus now. He was still a nursing baby when he went to the house of Pharaoh. Yochebed, his mother, who was his wet nurse, still, what child remembers, you know, if he was weaned, say, at the age of 18 months or so, how he ever remembered who his family really was? But yet there was something in him that he knew, but he wasn't sure. Especially after he slays the Egyptian and he runs into the wilderness and goes to the land of Midia. He must have just totally forgot about his people. And then the question looming in his mind, am I really Jewish or not? You know, that's kind of the way my own family that we went through. I was raised by another man, given another man's name, in fact. I was not raised as a Danun, I was raised as a Cummings. And until I was like 14 years old, I never knew any different. And my sister was the first one. My sister Laura was the first one to ever tell me, your father is not a Cummings. Then I found out that my father was Ronald Denim. And my, uh, you know, then I'm troubled, you know, like Moses, you know, you, 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 you just don't know then. You're not sure. Find out when I'm in my 20s that my mother was Jewish. My grandfather said they didn't want anyone knowing they were Jews. They kept it secret in the family. He said because of the persecution our family faced back in Germany that we went through and came to the United States illegally to escape the persecution of Jews there. And my own father's side of the family. You know, many, there's very few Danoons in the United States. It's very, very... A uh, small number of people here, yet there's a lot of Danoons in France, in Canada. All of those are Jews. Well, then why did our family become such a small one? The Inquisition caused them to convert to Christianity. So I can relate to this particular passage. When God says to Moses, I am the God of your fathers. Oh, excuse me, I'm the God of your father. He doesn't say fathers in this case. He just says to him, I am the God of your father. And then he says, let me just find it here again for you so you can see it. The Yom Eranochi Elochai Avicha. I am the God of your father. Elochai, I am the God or the God of Abraham, Elochai Yitzach, the Yaakov. Now he knows he's Jewish. Now he's met God, and the first thing that God does with Moses is confirm his identity. It gets even more interesting, though, as we go on from there. Begastet Moshe, Penav, Ki מהבעד אל האלוהים, ויאמר אדוני, ראו ראיתי את אני עמי. I have seen the suffering of my people, אשר במצרים and Egypt. ואת צעקתם שמעתי מפני נגשיו, כי ידעתי את המחב. אוקיי? God, you know, he's seen what Israel is going through. And um, the afflictions that the Egyptians are going through. 
And he tells him that he will, he will, he said, I will, I will come down and I will deliver them. Um, find my place again here real quick. Let me, let me skip forward for you just a little bit here. If you go to verse 11, because God is telling him all about what's going on, the oppressions that they're suffering, they're under the bondage of Pharaoh, uh, and in fact, if you th just just for for a point, because we're talking about the Bielski story as well, the Jews of Belarus were under anti-Semitic leadership for nearly 400 years. That is a historical fact. They were put into ghettos in Belarus. I forget exactly when, not in the beginning of their time, but they were put into ghettos more than once because of the anti-Semitic rulership, just as the Jews were put into slavery under the Egyptians. But they weren't put in slavery as at first. They were put in slavery about, I think, about 200 years into their 400-year time down in Egypt. Um, but anyway, we get to verse 11, and it says, um, Moshe el -chalahim. And Moses says to the Lord, who am I? Um, who am I to uh, to go to Pharaoh uh, El Paro? The key or to deliver, or, or or that I should take yeah, to deliver the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. The Yomer ki ihaye imcha imach. I love that. I love that verse right there. God says right here, Ve yomer ki ki ihaye imach. I will be with And he said, I will be with you. Imach. Ve ze lach haot, and this will be a sign for you, ki anochi shelachatecha bechustecha. Take the stick that's in your hand and cast it on the ground. Mm. For a sign now, ha'ot, for a sign. Mm. Blessed be the Lord. Wow. Uh, there's something in that right there I never saw before. And... Um, I've never done this with you before, I don't think, on WBN before. Uh, but every once in a while, I'll be going through scriptures like this, and then the Lord will begin to reveal something to me. And I have to follow this out. But I'm seeing something in this particular passage here about the stick. And the stick is a sign. And I can't help but think of the cross. Sin being judged, and it turns to a serpent. And I have to go back to that. I don't know what the Lord wants to show me on that, but I, I just paused for a moment because something there was something about that. Uh, I believe the Lord wants me to understand. But by His grace, pray for me. Maybe God help me to understand this better. Okay, but anyway, he so he takes he takes the serpent up, and and it becomes a stick again. The Yomer Moshe El Chayelachim Hine Anochibo El Bnei Yisrael. Okay, it says here, and, 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 he, and, and Moses says to God, uh, Behold, um, I go down to the children of Israel. And I say to them, uh, the, the God of your fathers. Now see, that, that's why I say earlier, he was showing him who he was. See, Avotechem is your fathers. You know, now the plural is to them. But see, God personalized it with Moses. Shelachani, the God of your father, sent me el el unto you. The li mashimo. They will say to me, "What is his name?" That's another one that has really, really been struck my heart. Was this right here? That is the same thing Israel will do when the two witnesses come on the scene. The first. Thing they're going to do. You claim. Let me let me just say something to you guys. 
I saw in one of the videos, we did that series recently on, on the two witnesses. And um, somebody was so kind to take up for me a little bit there. And they said, you know, Steve, you know, God has anointed you to teach these things, but it also brings out all the false prophets along with it. So there are so many people claiming to be Moses or Elijah. I get emails from everybody you can possibly imagine. And, and I don't mean any disrespect to the guys in, uh, out there that believe you're this or that, or if you believe that he's already come or whatever the case may be. No disrespect to you. But let me just share with you one thing. If you believe that you're Moses or if you believe that you're Elijah, then you have to know God's divine name. And I'm not just saying make up hocus pocus and say, oh yes, his name is actually this or his name is that. And I don't say that you have to know it right now. But when you go to present yourself to Israel, you will have to know it. Because Israel is going to ask the same question. And it really kind of got me about that. Why did Moses even say that in the first place? They will ask me, what is his name? They know there's only one God, but they're going to want to know what his name is. And so will it be today. And I know the Jews how they are. They're going to tell you straight up, you come to, you know, you're coming in the name of a prophet, but you, you, you better have your act together. And if you know anything about the Jews for Judaism, very, very intelligent rabbis. These rabbis didn't just fall off the pumpkin wagon, as we say in the South. You know, and if you try to come to them and say, you know, well, we prayed for the sick and the sick got well, or we raised the dead and everything, and we prophesied in the name of the Lord, let me tell you something about that. They're not just going to take anything just because you say you prayed for the sick and the sick raised from the dead. Okay. They, they know about miracles, okay? Israel knows about miracles, including the raising of the dead, okay? So you have to understand that God is with Israel and does tremendously mighty miracles for Israel. I mean, even though they don't want to, to discuss the Israeli, uh, the 1967 Six Days War, uh, because they said it's statistically impossible for it to happen, or for any of this to actually, it just, there's just no way the outcome could have, could have happened the way it did. It's divine intervention. Um, even the Muslims, the, they're fighting against,